Hey, what's up, y'all? Bob here uh, for another. This isn't going to be a live stream. This is one that we actually have to record, and then we're going to post it tonight. Uh, but you'll know why as soon as I introduce my guest, who is very near and dear to me. Uh, and I'm super excited to, to bring him on so we can explain what we're doing together. And uh, I think that you're really going to enjoy this stream because I think we're going to be do, doing something pretty significant. Uh, and so my guest today uh, is coming from deep, deep in uh, Europe uh, at a hidden location that we cannot disclose. We could tell you but then we'd have to kill you. So we, we can't do that. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce my guest. He is a retired homicide detective from the city of Chicago, Chicago PD. Uh, and his name is William, also known as Bill Dorsch. So let's bring him in. Bill, how you doing, my friend? I'm doing good, Bob. Welcome back from the CrimeCon convention. Oh, man, it was, uh, it was a whirlwind. It was three days of nonstop uh, excitement. So many great creators there. So many people in the true crime world. It was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, you know, like I got to meet so many listeners and they, you know, they came up to my table and we had your, your brand new book, which why yeah. don't tell what the people, the name of your new book is, which is available on Amazon, which we will have in the link attached to this in the show notes. What's the name of the book, Bill? Well, the name of the book, and I have it right here, is Omnipotent. Don't ask, don't tell. All right. And that is going to be... It's available a, on Amazon. Yeah, and we will have that link uh, available on the show notes for this. So you guys can just click on the Amazon link and it'll bring you right to the book. Because it's an unbelievable book. When you hear what Bill's been doing for the last 20 plus years to research for that book, you'll know exactly where he's coming from. And so they don't know anything about you, Bill. So let's let's okay. start right from the beginning. Let's tell them a little bit about you. Uh, so what did you do prior to moving over to Europe? What was your career? And uh, sure. get into it. Okay. Well, I'm, I'm born and raised Chicago on the northwest side of the city, Jefferson Park area. Went to the normal good Catholic high schools and stuff like that. And I decided that 1970, I joined the Chicago Police Department. And like most other new recruits, I started out in uniform patrol. And after a very short time, I was out of uniform. And I was working on tactical teams and then the gang team. And then later... In 1986 or 87, I was promoted to a detective. And uh, once I was a detective, I was signed to homicides and police-involved shootings. So that's where I spent the last, oh, eight years of my career before I retired in uh, 1994. Yeah, and and one of the things, and, and just so you guys know, Bill has more stories, not just about what we're going to be talking about today, but just in general about his years on the force that we'll have to have many, many more live streams where Bill can tell you about just the incredible stories that he's got going on. One of the things that we're going to be working on later down the road is uh, an old Chicago cop named uh, Reynaldo Grovera. Really, really bad guy. He's the opposite of what Bill is. Bill, Bill's a great cop. He did the job to always do good. Guevara was the opposite of that. Yeah. No, we're not gonna we're not gonna get into that now, but it's an incredible story. Uh and a story that's actually still going right now. Uh that's what's happening in the city of Chicago and the amount of yeah. exonerations, full exonerations from this guy's dirty work is mind blowing. But we're not gonna get into that now. So Bill, why don't you tell them the viewers how we came to know each other initially? Well, I, uh, it, 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 for you and I, it begins with John Wayne Gacy. Uh, I knew John Gacy. And when I was a Chicago police officer, I was on for about four years. And uh, I met John Gacy. And that's where the story, the story starts. But of course, we all know about the 33 murders or the 33 bodies that were recovered. They've always expected that there were more. And, uh, uh, well, I knew 
just about everything about Gacy because first off, homicide's always been an interest to me, but he was personal to me because I knew him. And of course, I recognize I was listening to podcasts or somebody told me to listen to a podcast and it was yours. And I recognized your name immediately in that you were the son of Robert Mata, who was one of Gacy's defense attorneys. So I had an interest and in, um, the more I listened to you, the more I started to connect with you because I found that you were presenting information that I already had questions about. And I was in agreement with you because I had met with Joe Kosensack, who headed the Displaced Police Department and their investigation of Gacy. And he had given me all their, well, I don't know if he gave me all, but he gave me a lot of their reports. And I questioned some very significant things in the reporting. And you were confirmation to my questions. So that's why I reached out to you because I thought you were onto it. Yeah. And you were giving me my answers. And I, I had heard of you. Like, so when you emailed me or messaged me through Viber, I can't remember how you, you originally got a hold of me, but I had heard of you from the part of the story we're going to get to here in a little bit from what we refer to affectionately as the sham dig in 1998. Um, you know, so I, I had heard of you tangentially and, and I had heard, I, I think probably where I first heard your name was from uh, the person who had produced the Devil in Disguise documentary. And, and she had told me that she had been working with you and that one thing led to another and that relationship had ended. And, and you know, so I had heard your name. Uh, come up with somebody who was very active in continuing to investigate many things about Gacy. Uh, I, I think that you and I both like diverge from her in terms of what we were wanting to investigate and what she was wanting to investigate. She was always kind of into the big, you know, pedo sex ring Gacy thing. That's not really your and I's thing. And that's not to say, I, I, is it a possibility that I existed? Of course it is. But, but you and I are into facts. You and right. I are into things that we can prove you and I are into things that we could try to, to dig up, maybe literally, um, in terms of trying to see if, in fact, there were more victims. And we were less inclined to get into, you know, the, the child trafficking sex pedo ring that, that she was more interested in. So we had that immediate connection right away. And, you know, when I started talking to you, I'm like, man, like Bill's the truth. You know, you started telling me about your background started telling me like how long you'd been researching into Gacy, all the interviews you'd done, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So I always think it's an interesting story. I, I, I love the story about how you ended up getting to know Gacy. And when I say no, you guys weren't fast friends, but you did happen to have an occasion where you actually had dinner in the guy's house. Yeah. Why, why don't you tell the people how that came about? Yeah. Well, my wife, uh, was working for an insurance company in Park Ridge, right on Devon Avenue. And uh, it wasn't very far from where Gacy was living. And uh, Gacy would come into her office, into the insurance office, and he would pick up repair claims from customers who had damage. He'd do the job, he would return to her office, and she would pay him for the work that was done. And then she came home one day and said, oh, we're invited to have dinner at this guy, John Gacy's house with his wife. Well, I never heard this guy's name before. I'm sure I never heard of it, but because my wife said, he's a nice guy, let's go. So we went and we met on that very house on Somerdale Avenue. Okay. And we spent about four or five hours with him, his second wife, her name was Carol. And she had two daughters and we brought my one son uh, Brian and my wife was pregnant at the time with my second son. Uh, so I, I recall that that was in the late winter, early spring of uh, 1974, because my other son was not yet born. And, you know, it's, it's strange. We've all probably realized this. We, you, you go through life and you meet someone or you at some location and you don't realize it at the time, but later in your life, that person or that location may become important to you. 
You never know. And that's exactly what happened with Gacy. But anyway, I now met him at his house. I had dinner at his house with his wife. It was an enjoyable time. Uh, he was very engaging. Uh, I think we played pool. I remember the pool table, and I don't think I would have passed it up. Um, there was a bar on one side of the room. And as my wife and his wife were sitting there and the kids were playing, he walked over and he brought out a pair of handcuffs. And he knew I was a policeman, you know, but he said, let me show you a trick. And I said, oh, John, I was in a training academy not too long ago. And I had handcuffs put on me every day or I put them on somebody else. I know the trick, John. You got to have the key. Oh. So he, he just sort of laughed and walked away. But then he comes back with a gun. All right. And he says, here, take a look at the gun. Now, guns are important to my profession. Okay. I understand guns. I know how to handle a gun, but I don't like to handle guns in the presence of others, especially little children. So I said, John, it's a nice gun. Put it away. I'm not interested. And he did. Right. But he asked a lot of questions about my job and my work. And he had re he had seen something about me in the newspaper. And he talked about that. And it was, it was engaging. He was, um, I, I, I had a good time. Okay. Yeah. I had not, no, nothing that turned me on or made me suspect that there was anything amiss with this guy. You know, but it's kind of funny because in my career as a police officer, I mean, I've been in hundreds maybe a thousand homes. I don't know. But there were things years later after he got arrested in 78 that I recall, vividly recall, that I don't think I would, if you put me in and asked me about somebody else's house, I wouldn't probably remember a thing. Right. You know, but I did remember things about his house. And anyway, so we had the dinner at the house and he did invite me back. You know, he said, hey, why don't you, you know, if you've got nothing to do, come on over, have a few beers, we'll watch a game. And I said, oh, yeah, John, sounds good. But the other important thing about that meeting was, and it's very important, is uh, during the dinner or after the dinner, you get into the usual conversation with people you just met. You know, where did you grow up? Where did you go to school? Where do you live now? Right. And I mentioned that I was living in an apartment on Elson Avenue, right near the intersection of Elson and Milwaukee in Chicago. And he says, Oh, really? He says, you know where Miami Avenue is? I says, yeah, that's about a hundred feet from where my apartment is. And he says, well, you know, the, the apartment building that's on the one corner on the North side of the street. Yeah. He says, well, I take care of that property. I said, Oh, well, nothing. It didn't really mean anything to me. You know, your maintenance, landscaping, whatever. If he'd been there before, I never paid attention to him. I don't think I ever paid, I never paid attention. I don't remember ever seeing him there. Right. But now that I had this meeting with him and I knew who his connection to that property, there were times when I'd be pulling my car out from behind the parking, in the parking area behind our apartment, I'd have to drive through the alley and turn into Miami Avenue. And that apartment building that he took care of was directly in front of me. And now I would see him there. Oh, and then I, yeah, and I would recognize him, right. you know, and then, then I'd be walking my dog, you know, day, morning and night, you know, and right. occasionally he'd be there. And we would have just very short conversations because he was a nice guy, but we, I, we didn't really bond his friends, you know. Right. Uh, you didn't have just, a bromance. You didn't have a bromance with Gay Seat Bill. Like you guys no, no, okay. no, no. But the thing is, now I did notice that he did have young boys with him there. Okay, when he was doing work, I don't think that I ever saw more than one boy with him at a time. Okay, but yes, he had boys with him. If you ask me then, what kind of work was he doing? I wasn't really paying attention. You know, he was just there. And so I'd go on and off, in and out and go to work and other things. But I always had to turn off of Milwaukee or off of Elston to get into the parking area behind my apartment. So I'd have to go onto Miami Avenue to turn into the alley. And one night it was it had to be about 19. 
75 because I was still living in the apartment. And about three o'clock in the morning when I'm coming home from work, we usually work from till two in the morning. Um, I'm, I'm make the turn with my car. And as I'm approaching the alley, I see John Gacy step out from between two parked vehicles. And I recognize him immediately. So I stopped the car and he recognized me. He walks up towards me and he's, you know, I, I rolled down my window and he was carrying a long spaded shovel. Okay. And I saw the shovel and I recognized it to be a spaded shovel. And I said, John, you know, what the frick are you doing? It's three o'clock in the morning. I know he doesn't live here, but I know he's the maintenance man. And he kind of snickered and said in a laughing manner, uh, you know, you got to get it done when you can. So I accepted that, you know, laughed probably. And I just went home, paid no attention to it. But then in 1978, oh, there's another thing. He actually came to my apartment, too, to do repair work uh, after we had that meeting at his house. Uh, we had a broken glass black window in the bathroom of the apartment that we rented. And my wife, uh, the landlord told my wife, if you can find somebody to fix it, have them do it and send us the bill. So she asked Gacy to come and fix it. Well, he came, but he brought a young boy, 17, 18 years old with him. And he gave him instructions on what to do. And he left the boy there saying, I'll return in an hour or so and I'll pick him up. And he did. He came back and, uh, checked out the work and was satisfied. We were satisfied. And we all went outside down the stairs to the park, to the parking area again. And before he left, he again invited me back to his house the second time. I and, wanted to be your buddy, Bill. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? Uh, I don't, I never did. I just never thought about it. it. I was busy with my life, my friends, my job, you know, uh, it just didn't connect. Okay. Yeah. But now we moved from that apartment. And so I don't know what's going on over there, but I did have friends that lived in that apartment. Another policeman actually lived in the very basement apartment that Gacy's mother moved into after they left. Okay. And I was in that building and in that basement apartment on numerous times because of my connection to Bruno Musinski and his wife, Lynn. And my wife and I would go there with our children to meet with them. And I even helped them move from the apartment to their home when they bought their home. And then I didn't know who moved in. But later, after he was arrested, I found out from Bruno and Lynn that it was Gacy's mother who mm -hmm. actually moved into that basement apartment. But after he's arrested in 78, December 21st of 78, I got a phone call from my wife. And I think I was working in the 19th district tactical team at the time. And she said, you got to pick up the phone. I mean, she got, so you got to watch television. John Gacy, who, and I recognize the name immediately, he got arrested for murder. And I go, whoa, yeah, that's, that's nasty. You know, but like everybody else in Chicago, suddenly we're mesmerized by the story. Yeah. It's not John Gacy kills one person. Today we got two. Tomorrow we got two more, then we got four more, and it's building, 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 building. Yeah. You know, and you go, holy cow, like everybody else in the city. I, I had dinner at this guy's house. They're digging out bodies from the very house that I spent four or five hours in. Yeah. Having dinner. I had no idea that anything was wrong. How could you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How could you is right. Anyway, but now with all these bodies being dug up, over a period of weeks. Uh, and now I, I know that the, the this Plains Police Department had done the surveillance and made the arrest, okay? And uh, after they made the arrest, almost immediately, the Cook County Sheriff's Office came in and said, little this Plains, we got this. You know, have a nice day. And they took over the investigation. And they were going on TV and they were saying, we need help from anybody. If you have any information about a missing boy that may have been connected to Gacy or of a location where you think there may be other bodies buried, 
give us a call. Well, you know, I'm a police officer. You know, I knew Gacy, been at his house. But that incident popped into my mind at 3 o'clock in the morning with the shovel. Right. I mean, it's not a bag of groceries he's carrying. It's not, uh, you know, furniture. He's carrying a spaded shovel, exactly the tool you need to dig a hole. And we know he's a digger. At this point, they're uncovering the bodies from his cross. Well, yeah. I mean, so I know this may be important. Yeah. So, of course, I want to give this information to people. I told people at work, my partners, my bosses, everybody about this encounter. But they all knew, like I knew, that Chicago Police Department were not handling the investigation. The Splains had taken, I mean, the Sheriff's Department had taken it over. So I called the Sheriff's Department and said, you know, this is a Bill Dorsch, I'm a police officer in Chicago, and you're seeking information. So I, I think you need to know about this. I don't know if it's anything more, but it's suspicion only. Because I saw him with a shovel at three o'clock in the morning, and I know he doesn't live there, but he is there at three o'clock in the morning. And now we have all these bodies being found. Perhaps you should go to that apartment building, meet with the people who live there, the owner first, find out who is living there and find out if there is anything amiss. Okay. Right. I gave the information. I gave him my name and I was done. There was nothing else for me to do. It was for the sheriff's department to do. So I just did what every other citizen would have done. Just gave the information and, and hoped and thought that they would follow it up. Only uh, years later, I found out through Bruno and Lynn at, that they were still in contact with the people who had become very good friends while they were living there, that nobody in the building in, had uh, been contacted by the sheriff's department. Or at Chicago any time, Police. Or Chicago police. Right. And Bruno, Bruno, having been a policeman also, when Gacy was arrested in the news, and he also said, you know, there's things about this guy and things he was doing here that, that me, my wife, and other people in the building thought were suspicious, and they all believed that bodies could be buried at this Miami Avenue location. So Bruno, he called, he didn't call the Splains, I mean, he didn't call the Sheriff's Department, he called the detective division. And he was told, uh, well, Bruno, that's real good, but we got enough bodies, we don't want any more. Which actually was the same thing I had been told, you know, when I was talking to the guy. But I said, no, you don't mean that. And when the guy was telling me, we don't want any more bodies, I said, no, you're asking about location. So this is what it is. But, right. you know, so and that's and that's during the period of time when they think that Gacy was dormant, like he, he was the maintenance oh, man in that oh, building. For, just so and, people have an understanding his his first known victim was in 72, uh, Tim McCoy. Now, right. that's known. Now, Bill and I have a little bit of a disagreement whether or not Gacy was active before 72. Uh, I think that he yeah. was Bill, convinced of it. Uh, I'm going to drag Bill to. Locations unknown <laughs> at this point. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to take the trip with you. Yeah, okay. we're gonna we're gonna take the trip. So, but the point being, after he had killed Tim McCoy, he buried Tim McCoy. He was the first first kid in the in the crawl space, and his wife Carol was complaining of the smell. So, right. Gacy, of course, said, "Oh, well, it's probably a dead raccoon. I'll, I'll handle it. I'll deal with it. Right. Don't worry about but it." See, I, what I've come to learn about Gacy is there was actually three parts to Gacy. The, during the first part, when he was married to Carol, that first murder occurred when she was out of town. Right. Okay. And then not only his mother, but her mother moved in with them for a time. Right. So he did not have the opportunity during that time from 72 of the first murder to about after her divorce in 76. Right. To be burying bodies there unless right. everybody was right. gone. Right. right. So and, that's and why Carol had two daughters, two young right. girls. So but I mean it was a house filled with people. All the time. Yeah. But that's why the Miami Avenue address is important. Because it was only about a 10 minute ride from his house in Somerdale. And Carol, his wife, said he would go out at late at night, he would come home. 
And he wouldn't come in the house, but he would go into the shed. And then after time, he would come out, go back, get in the car and drive away. And even neighbors, uh, the, the Grex, I think the name was next door. Uh, they even reported one time seeing him coming out of the shed to the car and they saw him lifting something very heavy and putting it in the trunk of the car. And then he drove away, wow. you know, so he had that, he had a shed that he told his wife not to go into ever. Okay. But when it was later examined and seen, it had mattresses, mirrors, uh, women's clothing, things like that. The torture and they board. Found, they right. The and they actually, and they found the body of Butkovich. That's right. Under freshly poured concrete. That's right. John you know. Buck, his third, what they think was his third in 75. Yeah. Bill and I do not think that it was his third. Uh, Bill and I think that it was, there were, there were more that happened in 72, between 72 and 76. Yeah. That's why we're giving you guys the background right now. That That's why Miami and Elston is a, an important address because just to understand Gacy had full access to that address You've got Bill Dorsch, Chicago PD, rolling up on Gacy at three in the morning. The guy's walking around with a shovel talking about he's got to do it when he can do it. And, you know, in, in my estimation, Bill, as much as I, I know about serial killers, can they go dormant for a while? Yeah. But right after they start, not typically. And for that period of time, when he just got the taste of it, if we're to believe that McCoy was the first one, we're not buying it. So, uh so why don't you tell the folks so that, that that's not where the story ends for you. That's really where the story begins in right. terms of you digging into Gacy. So, but, but before we jump into that, I just, I just want people to understand in 1978 where you would typically think that law enforcement would have an incentive and want to try to find out if there were more victims of this horrific serial killer, Chicago police, and the Cook County Sheriff's Department chose to elect to do nothing. They did zero investigation be, beyond digging out Gacy's property, which included the, uh, included the crawl, like you said, the shed where they found Butkovich and the other unidentified victim, which they found under his barbecue pit, and then the river where, where they had found additional victims in the river. Right. Beyond that, they did nothing. So when you hear about the Long Island serial killer or the Gilgo Beach Rex Hewerman arrest, and you hear about them all over the country, and they're digging in, they're trying to find out who else this guy may have killed in areas that he was visiting. None of that happened with Gacy. And, and Bill and I are disgusted by that fact. Right. And that is really kind of the impetus of our union, our partnership on this. And, and so, Bill, tell, tell everybody like what you started doing after you found out that in fact, Chicago police or Cook County Sheriff, after you went and, and Bruno had been over the building and said, hey, Bill, you know, they never even looked into the, they never even stopped by the building. What what did that lead you to start doing? Well, I, I always, uh, like I said, homicide was my thing, you know, and you're supposed to be able to prove your case and get all the answers that are, or as many answers as you can. All right. Learning that, because I was a detective, what's, the first thing you want to do is find out who the people are that are buried. Who are these kids, these bodies that are being dug up? All right. And it was, you had an easy starting place to go to because everybody knew that John Gacy was a contractor who hired young boys. And some of the boys that worked for him already had been reported missing by their parents who told the police in Chicago, we believe it's possible that this guy, John Gacy, who my son worked for, may have the answer to why my son is missing. They did nothing. 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 And at that time in the 70s, um, yes, Chicago had many thousands of missing kids. Some kids would go missing more than once in a year. Okay. But Usually the kids would be gone a day to and return. Okay. But the way the missing persons reports were handled at the time is your son didn't come home. Your daughter didn't come home. You call the police, the police dispatcher sends a squad car to your house and you, they take a one page report, maybe do the backside of the report. But the 
you know, unless you have specific information about maybe something bad may have happened to this kid, it's only a report. You know, if the kid is very young, you know, five, six, seven, can't survive on the street, of course, you're going to contact your sergeant and you're going to begin a search. But if he's 17, 18 years old, everybody's thinking, ah, this is on his own. He just wants to be, he'll be back. Don't worry about it. And usually you're telling the, the family, call us when your son returns. Okay. And thankfully for most people whose son did disappear, it was only for a day or two and they did come home with no harm, no, no hurt, no harm. But with, with the, with the Chicago police department, you had, the problem was you had six different areas. Okay, in the city, it's a big city. So geographically, it was divided up into six areas. And within the six areas were different districts. So an area might have four or five different districts. And because you didn't have computers, you couldn't convey information readily to another area where the youth division would, who was responsible for the missing persons case would not know what was happening in the other five areas. So if John Gacy's got a kid from area five and John Gacy's got a kid from area six who disappear, they don't even know about it because there's no link to each other. The report's made, it's taken back to the station, it's put in the department mailbox, a mailbag, and it's taken downtown. And after a period of time, it's sent to the various areas and then it's handed out to a youth officer. And usually the youth officer did but one thing. He called the house and said, is Johnny home yet? No. Okay. Anything new? Do you think he might be in danger? No. You don't have any idea where he's at? Well, call us when he comes home. Boom. That's and that it. was it. That was it. But when I learned that the police didn't do their job, uh, there wasn't really anything that I could do already on it. I mean, he got convicted in 80, sent to prison, and he was executed in May of 94. And in May of 90, before he was executed, in the months leading up to it, I vividly remember that I was there in Area 5 as a detective. And I'm thinking, you know, Bill, that information, you saw him with the shovel that night. Maybe you should go to the penitentiary and see if you can talk to him. You know? You know, I thought that's the only way you're going to get an answer. Maybe he'll tell you. Right. But then I thought, what are you doing? You know, if I go there and I tell John Gacy, oh, tell me, John, you're going to be executed in a few months. This is your last chance. Are there more bodies? Are there more kids? And maybe he feels bad and he says, yeah, Bill, there are. And this is where they are. You know what I've just done? I've given him life. Right. They're not going to execute him. Right. This investigation is now going to start all over. Yeah, you're going to find more bodies, but I got already 33 kids whose parents are grieving and want them dead. And I and he deserved to die. Right. So I never did go to the penitentiary, and I don't regret it to this day because I think those people, those families needed the answers and they needed to put this behind them. Need and justice. that's why, yeah. Go ahead, Bob. I they needed justice. They wanted to. They wanted their eye yeah. for an eye. You know. I mean, right. it was time. Right. And like you said, I mean, that would open up a whole new can of worms. Yeah. You know? And so, so I really couldn't do anything uh, other than watch him get executed. And he he was executed in May of of uh, ninety four, and I retired in August of ninety four. Right and. Uh, you know, going into retirement, all I still had was John Gacy standing on the street with a shovel and nothing more. You, I know the law. I know that I can't go to a judge and ask for a search warrant. I mean, how would you feel if I, the police come to your house and that's the only information they have? And they say, uh, Mr. Mata, we're going to dig up your front lawn and backyard. Yeah. You know, would, based on only yeah. that information. Right. It's not going to happen. Right. You know, so there was nothing I could do during that time. And so I was in retirement, living in my happily in Wisconsin. And uh, 
I came back to Chicago in 1998, four years after I had retired. And uh, that's when I got connected with uh, a young man who was uh, writing and he needed information about John Gacy. And uh, he sat down with me and I think we spent about, uh, oh no, that, excuse me, that's jumping ahead. I'm sorry, that's going to 2011. I don't want to go there yet. Uh, but in, in 1998, uh, when, when I came back to Chicago to help to help prepare my son who was going on the police department, he needed a place to live. And I helped him out with the apartment and such. And I thought, well, while I'm here, uh, maybe I'll just go to work. So I connected with my old homicide boss who had been the head of Area 5 Detectives when I was there. And he said, yeah, Bill, I'd like you to come work for me and you could handle the criminal investigations for me. I said, oh, okay, good. Well, about a month or so after that, um, I was contacted by the Better Government Association of Chicago. And they had used me before in other cases when I was a policeman to run some stuff past me. And they were involved in the Brown's chicken homicides. All right. And, and uh, that was Palatine. Palatine, and, right. And, uh, they had done an investigation of their own into those unsolved murders at that time. And they wanted to meet with me and they wanted to ask me about my opinion of their investigation. So I went to meet with them and uh, we talked about the Brown's chicken murders. And then we went across the street to a restaurant and there were a couple other pe people there. There was a, a Doug Longini, who was a uh, producer director for 48 hours, he happened to be there and somebody else in the news was there. But we're sitting there having our, our meal. And as it always is, because you're the policeman, somebody's always got questions. And somebody asked me a question about, Bill, you were a homicide detective. What kind of cases bothered you the most? And I said, well, that's easy. I said, that's the one where you believe you know who the murderer is, but you don't have enough evidence to get them charged. That bothers you. So I gave them several examples. And I also brought up the incident with Gacy. I said, that thing still bothers me. You know, I'm never going to know the answer to that. Right. And so that meeting was over. About a day or so later, I got a phone call from them at Better Government Association. And they said, Doug Longini and us, we'd like to know the answers like you. We found your story very interesting, and we'd like to help. If you find a way that you can investigate that property on Miami Avenue, we'd like to be involved in any way you know, we can. Because they all thought, like, everybody should. They're still missing kids. Right. Everybody said Gacy killed more than just the 33 that was found. He said, right. he told the police, at least 50. Right. Okay. So I went back to work and I told my uh, old homicide boss who now had the private investigative company, uh, Jim Froon was his name. I told him about the meeting with the Better Government Association. And he says, well, Bill, you know, everybody believes that Gacy had more victims. Why don't you take some of the time at work for me to investigate and find out what you can? So what I was specifically looking for, Bob, was equipment technology that years later could search a property without digging. Cause I, like I said, nobody wants you to be digging up their front yard right. on just suspicion. I needed more than that. Right. So searching for this technology, I came across ground penetrating radar and I found out uh, that it had been used mostly in Europe, even in Australia and New Zealand. I was on the phone talking to people who had used it in Australia and New Zealand and England. And they all were swearing that this is a good tool. They've used it in murder cases in England and found bodies. They've been using it in cemeteries. But I needed somebody that was an expert with the equipment in the United States that could help me. So I found through them, uh, they directed me to uh, Ron LaBarca who owned U.S. Radar Company in New Jersey. And so I gave Ron a call and told him why I uh, was suspicious about this property. 
And I thought the technology was exactly what we needed to search. And he was interested enough that he said, by coincidence, I'm going to be in Chicago area next week for some kind of gathering. And we can meet there. So I told Jim Froon, I told the people at Better Government Association, and we arranged to meet them at the resort uh, in the western suburb of Chicago. And we, we explained to him again the suspicion about the property and the belief of, that there were more bodies buried, that we, and we wanted to find them. And he said, well, I'd like to help you. He said, let's go out in the parking lot. Let me show you the equipment. I'll demonstrate it for you. So he took out his radar equipment from the car, put it together, and we walked through the parking lot, and he showed us examples of what he could see in the ground. And usually that equipment was used to locate like under underground uh, piping, you know, water, gas lines, things like that. But he had used them himself to find bodies. Okay. And so he knew what to look for in that case. And we ended that meeting. He returned to, to New Jersey and we all talked about it and said, you know, we got to do this. You know, we owe it to these families whose kids never came home. Right. And Jim Froon and I and the Better Government Association, we contacted Ron and asked him to return to Chicago. He said, no problem. You tell me when I'll be there. And so that was now in 1998. It's 20 years after Gacy has been arrested and he's now executed. But I'm a homicide detective from Chicago, retired, and I know they don't want any more bodies. I mean, they hurried Gacy. You know, you're a defense attorney. Uh, most homicide trials, they linger in the courts for years before years. you go to trial. Yeah. You got a case where 33 bodies are found, and they're rushing it through in less than a year and a half. Yep. They're in a hurry to get this case done and over with because they were getting very, they were getting a lot of criticism from the time that Gacy was arrested and being accused of not doing a good job that perhaps would have saved lives had they done so. Yeah. I mean, they you know. tried the bill with many, many of the victims unidentified. Yes. You know what I mean? I mean, like talking about pushing it through. They, you know, they, they tried the case with a bunch of John Doe's where they just didn't even know who these kids were at all. I mean, just to go to your point that they really crammed that thing through the system as quickly as they could. And, you know, and on top of that, you know, I had talked to my father. I'm like, well, did you ever think about severing the cases? Meaning, you know, all the mm -hmm. murders took place at different times over the course of years there was an argument that could have been made that they could have severed all those cases and forced them to try them individually. Ultimately they landed on, I think everybody agreed, let's just try them together. But, you know, I mean, it, it goes to your point, you know, they really, they really pushed that through much quicker okay. than your typical homicide case, especially with that many victims. Yeah. Even today, Bob, I, there's a case, this is 23. I think it's six years ago. I was asked by a family to find, a relative, an older man who had gone missing, and they had reported him missing to Chicago. But because he was 60 some years of age, nobody's looking for him. Okay. But when they asked me to look for him into it, uh, I found out that he had been murdered in his own apartment, dismembered, and thrown into the garbage. Wow. And I gave that information. I called the area six. Uh, to report it, that it's not a missing, it's actually a murder case, and I can tell you who did it. All right? Wow. And a, and a no, sergeant... I'm telling you guys that Bill has lots of stories. We're yeah. not going <laughs> to... Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get over it. But I'll tell you what the sergeant told me, uh, That and then we'll go on from there. I said, you got to look at this case, it's not a missing. He says, well, Bill, when you find a body, call me back. And he hung wow. up the phone on me. Okay. Wow. Well, what was I going to do? But we're, we're, that's another story for another time. <laughs> okay. But uh, so anyway, we've done the radar scan and we got this information now. Uh, Ron LaBarca. Uh, oh, wait, we, 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 I, I want to tell you about the scene. 
with the day we did the scan. We, we asked Ron Labarca to return to Chicago and we met with him and we put the radar equipment together at uh, the park near to the Miami Avenue address because we didn't want to draw attention. See, we, I knew and Jim Froon knew uh, that the Chicago police don't want us doing this. Right. So we can't go to them and say, well, tell them what we're going to do or try to do. But we also know that we can't really go to the homeowner, the apartment building owner, and ask him for permission. But I found out that the apartment owner didn't live on the property. He lived in the suburbs. So I found out who lived there and through, did surveillance on them and everything and got an idea for about when they left and when it was available. And we decided that we're going to do it without permission. We're going to go right to the place. The equipment will be set up. We're going to get in there and we'll go and do as much as we can. Of course, if somebody comes out and says, hey, get the hell out of here, you know, we're going to have to stop. Okay. But nobody stopped us that day. But we did only the front and we did the parking lot. We didn't get around to the back area with the sidewalk and we didn't get into underneath the porches and such. But the survey is, I mean, the, the, the scan is done and we decided to go back to the Better Government Association offices downtown. Uh, Jim Froon, he had to go somewhere else with uh, Rocky Rinaldi. Uh, and I was the last one to arrive at the Better Government Association office. And when I walked in, I mean, I was met at the door by uh, uh, Lyons, John Lyons. I mean, uh, Mike Lyons, who was the investigator for the Better Government Association. And he and somebody else uh, uh, were really excited. And I, they said, Bill, Bill, you got to see this. And I went, what, what, what? You know, now, there's bodies there. Ron's looked at the scan and he believes that there's bodies there, you know, several bodies there. And I'm like, whoa, slow down. Because, you know, I was the one that was telling everybody, we got to keep this thing quiet. I mean, I would have been okay. I just wanted to get the answer about the property. And if we were to scan and Ron said, there's nothing here, I'm fine with it. That's, I've done it. I've done the job that the police should have done. Okay. Right. But if there's bodies there, whoa, you know, but I'm, I'm still, I'm leery about it. And I'm thinking, holy Christ, there's bodies there. <laughs> this is bad news for some families, you know, and I'm thinking about, Oh man, all this years later, now I'm going to be walking through the door. The police are going to be walking through the door, not me and saying, we have a body that's been identified as your son at this location. And I'm not so happy about that. I mean, I want more proof. And like Ron LaBarca said, this is the scan is an indication that bodies could be buried there. From my experience, I think they are buried there. He sent that information to Europe, to others, experts, and they confirmed their belief was as his, that there were, these are possibly grave sites. And let me jump in real quick, just so people understand, when you're talking about GPR technology, it's not like an x-ray machine. Like So you're, you're not seeing like bones. What you're seeing right. is what we call anomalies. So when Correct. you look at the reading... Correct. It looks kind of like waves, like sound, like it's the equivalent of sound waves. And they're showing the soil, levels of the soil. And if there's an anomaly, a disturbance, you'll see it. So Ron LaBarca, being who he is, is able to identify multiple anomalies that appeared to be pretty substantial in size, which is what led you guys to believe, wow, we might have some bodies here. Right, right. right. And so... Later that night, meeting with uh, Jim Froon, his, my old sergeant, Rocky Rinaldi, who worked for Jim uh, at a gathering of police officers for a promotion party, uh, talking about it, the next step was obvious. Okay, we have this information. It's not just based on Bill Dorr's suspicion. Now we have some, some evidence, technology. We have to take this to the police. So at that very party that night, Jim Foon went to the bosses that were there from the police department way up on the chain, the command. And they said, well, yeah, Bill's talked about this for years, you know, his suspicion. Now you have this. Sure, if you need our help, we'll do anything you need. You know, we'll have to talk about it. So I left that party thinking, well, Jesus, for the first time in my life, 
since I thought about this. Maybe we're going to get the answer. All right. And the obvious thing was, what's to do next? Well, the obvious thing was, Jim had told the police about this information. We're going to have to have a meeting. Nobody's going to be running over to the apartments on Miami with a bulldozer and start digging up the property. We have to turn it over to the police. They're going to make a decision whether the evidence is valid or not from their own investigation in talking to Ron LaBarca. They don't have to talk to Bill Dorsch about the radar scan because I'm not the expert. All right? But I'm done. But they should talk to Ron LaBarca and confer with others, experts. And if they believe that bodies are there, they are required to search. That's their job. It's right. a commitment made to the families of missing children. Nobody in society would expect that anything less than a proper, thorough, honest investigation was going to be done. But it never happened. So, you know, we can get into that. Uh, yeah, that's... You know, you... Yeah, so that kind of leads to our relationship. And that leads yeah. to what we're going to be doing. And, and if only... Only you would put like put all this in a written format and like wrote a book about it. Like it's too bad. Why don't you throw that thing up again so the people can see it? Because we're just scratching the surface here with Bill's book. Well, like we're, we're, this is probably like this is just the beginning of the book. What Bill's investigation is, and again, we'll have the link to that in Amazon for Amazon. Y'all should buy it. It's an unbelievable book, Bill is so knowledgeable. Bill put in so much research. He did so many interviews with so many different people. Like, like Bill, I don't know if you can tilt your camera. And if not, if you look at Bill's, the shelving behind Bill, it's just filled with all of his Gacy material from. Oh, that's on the other side. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here I got the white books are all Gacy. Yeah. The file cabinets, four drawers. It's all, all gay here. All, all this is all, all gay. So, so Bill has been digging in. Bill is a deep diver like myself, which is why we form such a, a great friendship. And I, I'm incredibly excited uh, about the, the potential for us to help families get closure after all these years. We're both in it for the same reason. And what we're going to be, what we're going to be doing is, is we're going to be. First and foremost, we're going to dig into everything that Bill dug into with respect to the failure of the Chicago police when nothing was ever done for all these years. We're going to expose it for what it was. And if you've listened to our pod or my podcast, you know I'm pretty tough on the Chicago police in terms of what I felt was a complete lack of competence and any kind of investigation whatsoever. And, and Bill felt the same way. That was That was what our connection was. And so we're going to be exposing all that through the course of our second season of, of Casey part two. And, but we're also going to be boots on the ground. I've got to get Bill from his undisclosed location in Europe back here to Chicago to help me, but I'll be doing what I need to do. Boots right. on the ground while I'm waiting for Bill to get here. And we, we have, we have very, and it's not just Miami and Elton. There's other locations that we're not going to name now that we think that there's a high likelihood uh, that there could potentially be victims there. And we're going to be yes. looking at these, these areas as well. And One that I think that we're going to be foreclosed on is the old Rainbow Roller Rink. Unfortunately, that property has been raised completely, and they've built an enormous structure on that building now, Bill. But, but they did find two bodies buried there. They did. They did. And and I'm not I'm not convinced that they weren't Gacy victims based on my interview that I did with uh, who was it Ant Antonacci? Yes. David Antonacci. So he he was a guy that had worked with Gacy, who was actually doing that uh, demo over there at the Rainbow Roller Rink. And was absolutely, he was the only guy that ever escaped from Gacy after being put in the handcuffs. Right. He actually, he wrestled Gacy to the ground, got the handcuffs off, got Gacy in the handcuffs. And this is when he's a teenage kid, but like uh, he, like he was an, a wrestler. So he yeah. had, he'd like turned, flipped the script on Gacy, gotten Gacy on the cuffs. 
And, you know, and it's still, even at that point, he's like, I didn't think Casey was going to kill me. I just thought he was like a weirdo. You know, I thought he was messing with me because yeah. that's a teenage mindset. He had no idea this guy was a killer. Mm -hmm. But about the rainbow roller rink is Gacy was dumping all the refuse, not outside in the dumpsters, but behind this, this, this wall. And he said, don't worry, right. about it. I'm bricking that whole wall up. That was, that was actually uh, Zelensky, Martin Zelensky. No, but so Zelensky's yeah. Zelensky was there too, but Antonov. Yeah, they were both there at the same time. Yes, right. exactly. So Zelensky was there, and Zelensky, his claim to fame with Gacy is he was the guy. He was a photographer, and he had taken all the pogo pictures, all the clown pictures. Those were right. all taken by Zelensky. So both those guys were in there, and both of those guys basically gave us the same statements that look we have no doubt that Casey had dumped bodies in there because he ended up walling it up and he did that job by himself. Right. He got that all walled up by himself or maybe with the help of Cram and Rossi, who knows at that point, but you know, he, he was there without his, his helper guys there. So, but that's, that's a property that, that uh, I, I think that we certainly owe it to the victims families to dig into the remains that were found there. I know that they tried to hang it on uh, as a couple of gangbangers I don't know if I'm buying that. That is a place where Michael Marino, 14 years old, often went with Kenny Parker and his other friends. Yeah, which is a whole nother. It was I less than a mile, Marino less story. than a mile walk, less than a mile walk from where he lived to the rainbow. Yeah, we're not going to get into Mrs. Marino's story, which is really the story that drew Bill in more than yeah. anything else. And I think yeah. we'll save that for our next stream because we're going to be doing these streams because we want people to have an understanding of what we're doing. We want people to get excited about it. We want people, if they're willing to, to help us in terms of we'll probably end up doing a, a, some kind of crowdfunding or crowdsourcing for, for help financially if you guys want to get out there and help us do what we want to do with boots on the ground, because it's going to cost money uh, in terms of what we want to do over at Miami and Elston, Bill and I are going to have to have in order, <laughs> because I'll just tell him flat out, Bill, Bill and I snuck onto that property again, again, yes, with on penetrating radar. Talk. Unfortunately, this time the owner of the property or the guy who claims that he's the owner of the property caught us while we were out there but we did find the same anomalies in the same place. Yes. Uh, and, you know, they had done what we call a sham dig in 98, which we didn't really get into. Uh, but, you know, Bill had orchestrated this whole thing through a ton of pressure through the media because Bill had, you know, you didn't really kind of get into that part of the, the story where, you know, after you had that first meeting, you had another meeting and you were getting the cold shoulder. And you know, I wasn't were, just getting it was not just a cold throat shoulder from the police, I was getting threatened. Threatened, exactly. My family was getting threatened, my sons who were on the police department, exactly. So they end up through through Bill going through other channels, which we often have to do to try to get police to, to look at cases that are cold when they don't seem willing to do so. Bill went through the media and put a ton of pressure on, on the Cook County Sheriff in order to get uh, them to do what we, again, we consider to be a sham dig in 98, where they quarantined off the entire area. They had the, the crime scene tape. They kept everybody back at bay. They bring in LaBarca. And did Dittmer come in for that one too? Yes. Yes. No, so not, not uh, LaBarca only did the first one with Dittmer. The second was done at night with uh, FBI and some dogs. Allegedly. <laughs> Allegedly. I've got that report too. Getting the reports is another story. Right. You so know they, them. Yes, I do. So they 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 did the first one. They had erected a little tent. Uh they had invited Dittmer and, and LaBarca and they said, Oh, you know, show us. So a couple of the sheriffs, Cook County Sheriff's deputies go in there. So show us where not to dig, you know, because we don't want to be wasting our time. Can and LaBarca points them to a few places and so yeah, don't dig here. There was a huge bush there. You know, don't dig there. So they say, okay, you got to go. And LaBarca and Dittman are like, what do you mean? Don't don't you need us in here so that we can show, we'll show you on the scan exactly where you are. They're like, no, we're good. We're good. You guys need to go out. We need to do this alone. Well, let me let me tell the people. Yeah, in, the back the people. Of my, in, in the back of my book, in the appendix, you're going to find a letter from Ron LaBarca about the search 
and how even before the search was done, he was basically told and he believed they don't want to find any bodies. And he was restricted from going to certain areas, areas that he had done before when he searched it with us. Yeah. And he was told only to pick two places to dig. And then they put up the tent. But Ron LaBarca and Dittmer were not even present for the dig. They were put in the car and taken back to the airport. So they had no idea where or if the police had dug. Yeah. But I got Ron's letter here. Scathing and letter. In his own dismay, there's one part here where he said there was enough evidence, anomalies there on the property that should have sent a trained detective running to a hardware store for a shovel. Boom. Well, and they didn't and I, do it, but we're doing it, Bill. Right. And there's there's other affidavits here, uh, responses to my FOIA requests, uh, where I got answers back from the Sheriff's Department, the Chicago Police Department, and the Chicago Police Department only assigned one detective to assist the Sheriff's Department. This Plains only assigned one detective to the Sheriff's Department. The Sheriff's Department had it all. But in all these uh, answers from the FOIAs, you will see that they said they did not do a search. They only tried to identify the, the bodies that had already been found. Yep. Which there are still five that are un, unidentified right. to this day. Even despite the fact that we have the massive advances in DNA technology, for some, some inexplicable reason, there are still un, five unidentified victims and that's part of what else we're going to be doing. We're going to be trying to hopefully everything is going to snowball. I think that we could apply enough pressure on them and the Cook County Sheriff's Department and in particular uh, Jason Moran, who is the one heading it over there. I, I don't know what the slow play, the reason for the slow play and getting these victims identified is, but I find it to be unacceptable. And I think that the families deserve to know. And I, and I think that it's it's been long enough, Bill. And I think it's been right. far long enough. And, and I think that these families need closure. And uh, so I'm, I'm really excited about what we're doing. And show them, show them the book again, Bill. Give us the name of it. Yes, it's uh, the name is Omnipotent. Don't ask, don't tell. And I named it Omnipotent because I believe, from what I find, that governments on Earth believe they're God. They tell us what they want us to know. They want to tell us what's right and what's wrong. And we are supposed to walk through life believing them on everything. They're the final say on anything. Yeah. Like and God. We, yeah, that's scary thought. That's a scary thought. So uh so we're we're like in the midst of this, man. We're gonna we're gonna be starting this imminently. And you and I have already started recording uh, what's going to be Gacy Part 2. So Bill's book is available now. Gacy Part 2 will be coming out in the very near future with our episodes that we'll be recording. And it's going to be partially us in studio. It's going to be us boots on the ground. It's going to be me boots on the ground. And it's going to be Bill when I can get his butt back here from. <laughs> yeah, well, from here. You know, I'll be there. I know you'll be here, my friend. So, all right, Bill. Uh, Thank you very much for, for joining me today. Uh, we're going to be doing quite a few of these. Uh, I think that what we want to do is start teasing some of the stuff that you have in that amazing book of yours. You know, when I, when I first read uh, the first chapter you sent me, the, the hair on my arms was standing up. So uh, it's that type of book. So I highly recommend everybody immediately go and purchase that. As I said, it's available on Amazon now. And it's going to be a, an excellent uh, partner piece to the podcast because what the book doesn't get into, we'll be getting into because you can't talk about boots on the ground that we're going to be doing now in a book. That just has right. to be done by us. So, but that the book is going to be telling you everything that Bill has learned over the past two decades and why we believe that we need to be doing what we're doing now. It is our, it's our, it's our guidebook to what we need to be doing now, why we're going to be doing it and the places that we're going to be doing it at. So it, it's an amazing book and uh, you're an amazing guy. And I, I'm so glad that we're doing this together and I couldn't be more excited about it. And uh, why don't you say goodbye to the folks, Bill? 
Well, thank you for listening to me. And you're going to find this. Uh, there's going to be a lot of answers, a lot of answers to questions that were never asked that should have been asked. Indeed. Indeed. All right. Till next time, my friend. Bye, Bob. Have Take a good day. All right. Bye. All right, y'all. So there you go. Uh, that was Bill Dorsch, uh, an amazing guy. He was an amazing cop for a long, long time. He he did it the right way. It's that simple. Like, you know, like my relationships with police as an attorney, in particular, a criminal defense. I, I've said it before and I've said it a million times. I love good cops. They're, they are an absolute necessity in our lives or for our society to operate properly. And I detest bad cops. But the same is to be said for any any profession. You know, the good and the bad. The problem with the police is that when you have bad cops, it tends to bleed into the, the, the reputation of the good cops, which really isn't fair, but it's the nature of the beast. And Bill Dorsch, I'm just telling you, and I can say it definitively, it's one of the best cops I know. The guy was a credit to his profession. And when I'm telling you, the guy has stories. Casey is just scratching the surface. But the amount of research that he's done uh, over the past 20 years is going to blow your mind. And it's all in that book. So I recommend you buy it. If you have any interest in Gacy and knowing the real truth about what went on with the lack of the investigation that happened with what went on with family members of victims or maybe family members that Chicago named as victims that may not have actually been victims. It's it's stunning. Like the amount of work that Bill did on this thing is is unbelievable. And do yourself a favor. It's an incredibly compelling read. Go and order it now. And you're going to want to have read that before you start listening to the podcast. I, I guarantee it because it's going to fill in the gaps that, that we're not going to be able to fill in with the pod. Because as I said, we're going to be out there doing stuff. We're not just going to be sitting behind a computer talking about it. That is our plan. So, all right, y'all. Uh, thanks for joining. And again, we didn't do this live. Uh, I'm going to drop this tonight, uh, which I believe today is uh, October 9th. So this is going to be in lieu of my live stream tonight because that bill, again, is, I think, seven, eight hours ahead of us. It would have been an unreasonable hour for me to have him on the live. Uh, he would have been half asleep. It would have been two, three in the morning for him. So we decided to do it this way. Hopefully we still get the traction on this because... Uh, we believe it's a great live. It's great content. So y'all make sure you like, share, subscribe. We want to get this word out there. We want this video getting out there. We're relying on you guys to do it. So we will see you next time. Uh, I'll be back live Wednesday and I'll be having Bill frequently. Like Bill's going to be a constant uh, guest on, on our YouTube streams. Allie happens to be in Miami, but really this is a, a Bill and I story anyway. So uh, Ali probably won't be joining us on these lives. It'll just be Bill and I. But uh, thanks for joining, and we will see you next time. Take care, y'all. Mm -hmm.